Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. All this day has been very interesting with different speakers we had, different panels. Um, this time, uh, my name is Kim Alfonso. I am a member of ALA, and I will be moderating the panel of Creative Industries in Latin America. It is my pleasure to welcome these wonderful panelists. Nice. And throughout the panel, they will talk about the relationship between creativity and cultural economy, relations at the Orange County, the of Industry in America, and the production of telenovelas. Um, please join me in welcoming our wonderful speakers. Mm. Our first um, panelist is Felipe Huitrago. Okay. Felipe Huitrago is the co-author of the Orange Economy and the okay. Conference at the Iron American Development Fund, Culture, Solidarity, and Creativity at First Division. For over 12 years, he has worked on the development of the Orange Economy from various perspectives, various angles, as advisor in the Ministry of Culture of Colombia, Program Manager in the British Council and Director of the Iber American Observatory of Copyright. Please welcome Felipe Luchado. Hello. Thank you very much. First things first, smile. Let's <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> start. Where is that? He's here. Is that? No. Okay, thank you. Well, as you have kindly mentioned, uh, I come from the IDB, Inter-American Development Bank, and well, I'm going to talk about uh, the orange economy in a way. So I will try to make this as painless as possible. This is our presence and my uh, Twitter for those of you who like social networking and to keep in the loop and probably post some nice pictures about me. I promise to respond with the picture I just took. Uh, this guy is James Lovell. He's an astronaut, was an astronaut, and was impersoned by Tom Hanks and made famous by a phrase. Houston, we had a problem. I'm here to tell you we have a problem. The problem is we have this machine. This machine is called Watson, and it's the great, 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 great grandson of something called the Blue. The Blue beat uh, and Atoli, no, Yuri Kasparov on a chess match. And that was the first. But then other versions have beaten people and the best players of Jeopardy. What we have here is the ability of new technologies to replace a lot of works. Between, 50, between 25 and 50 percent of the jobs we humans can do today and we have to do today are going to be automatized in the next 25 years. So with that in mind, now consider that we have a region with 107 million people between the ages of 15 and 24. This means about 10 million of them will join the ranks of those looking for opportunities in a very interesting and volatile job market. So if we, we think about them and how we're going to give them opportunities, well, uh, we have to also think that this group of people, these 107 million youth in Latin Americans, they also represent what we in economics call the demographic bonus. What is the demographic bonus? It's simply the moment in which the number of people joining the labor force is superior to the number of people that is becoming dependent. That means people becoming too old to work or people who are just being born and therefore they need assistance, right? Uh, the thing is, in the past, this has been a very good plus. China and in particular the, the, the Asian tigers use this uh, bonus in a very clever way. They move millions of people from the rural areas to the cities and make them work in factories. Problem in Latin America, we already have more than 80% of our population in cities and uh, in relative terms, we are already quite industrialized. So factories for these kids, I don't see any workers here. Agriculture, I don't see anybody picking up 
those grapes. Through this, this is for the US. This is a, 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 a very nice uh, representation of what's going on in the rest of the world. This is the US in the 50s, in the early 50s. Uh, divergence, services started to grow as the share of labor. While manufacturing came down, government stabilizes around 20% and agriculture is disappearing. Most of the world, with the exception probably of uh, Western Europe, uh, are not quite there yet, but are pretty much like about here for manufacturing as services. Government may be around here and agriculture around here. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the trend. You can argue as much as you want against that, that's gonna happen. So what we need to do, we have to be very creative. How we are going to involve these people into the world with opportunities that make some sense. Well, fortunately, we have artists. We have creative people and they come to the rescue, which is kind of an irony considering that uh, creativity and arts and culture tend to be invisible for those in the economic sector. But in order to explain how it works, I'm going to ask help to my friend Daniel. Daniel, he's from Honduras and he grew up like many people. He grew up enjoying his culture, being aware of the codices of the Mayas. He was also very proud of the legacy of, of the Mayans in, in, his, in his country, these great monuments. But he also grew up, like many other people in the world, loving video games. And he found that in those video games, he could not find his identity. He was unable to find himself reflected in the narratives, in the stories, in the aesthetics he was playing with. So he decided to, hmm, what if I mix this with this? Mayan Pits. This is the first ever mobile version of a game of the Juego de Pelota from the Mayas. He made uh, all the thing the way it's supposed to be done, you know? A business plan, great market research, a piloting, and it's going well, I have to say. And the thing with this is that uh, when you are doing this business, there's a lot of things we don't know. And because we don't know a lot of things, there are also enemies for our creative entrepreneurs who are the ones in charge to give us the opportunities. The first is, as I said, creativity and arts and culture tend to be invisible in economics. Well, thankfully, a lot of people have been doing research and trying to find these intersections between culture and creativity and economics. You will find that it's very difficult to see them together. Why? Essentially, because when you think about culture and economics, we usually think about them as two completely separate things. Right? Is they are both sides of the same coin. And when we have one coin in our hands, how many faces we can see at the same time? Only one. We need to trust the other is behind. And if we make this abstraction and we find these points of intersection, these cultural goods and services, then we can measure the impact. Not of all of it, but its commercial, so, um, it's commercial um, inputs to the economy. So John Hawkins has calculated that about 6% of the world GDP comes from creative economy. That's very, very large numbers. Many people get confused with large numbers because 6%, you see, yeah, 6% is like nothing, you know, I mean, it's whatever. 6% in the world economy means 20% more than the German economy, two and a half times all the military expenditures of all the countries in the world combined. That's massive. And in Latin America, this means that all the cultural and creative industries in the region produce as much as all of Peru. Creates international commerce about the same as Panama, which is a very important international uh, trade uh, hub. And employs about the same amount of people between the ages of 15 and 65 in the Northern Triangle, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. This is not small, this is very large. To put this into a little context, this is the Three Gorges Dam in China. This is the largest uh, energy plant ever built in the world. It took 30 years between 1982 
and 2012 to build this. It took massive resources. It took an incredible amount of uh, environmental uh, control, uh, works. Uh, it took two million people to be displaced, relocated, and recreated in their lives. It cost $25 billion. That's thousands of millions of dollars in 30 years. In the same 30 years, 10 musicals in the West End and Broadway uh, reported sales of 27 billion in merchandising and box office. That's very, very, very big. But a part of being in, in, invisible, the other problem that Daniel has found is that his market, his natural market, is very underdeveloped. Why? Well, in part because it's not really well connected to the world. But thankfully, internet has come and we are kind of getting faster into certain uh, international markets and we can find niches of consumption and people like-minded across the world and create a different way to, to sing, to, um, to, to, to do the, the business of creativity. We have here today a lot about how much local you can be, but this is part of it. This is not the only thing, but it's part of what we have to take advantage of. The other problem is finance. It happens that access to money is very difficult not only in creativity, it's very difficult in many industries. Actually, for most industries, it's very difficult. We are used to see very large numbers with industries like oil, but only because they have consolidated big companies, because they need to. But when you see any sector that is based on small businesses, it's very difficult to see those large numbers. And when we cannot find that money, it's, it's that, that's a challenge. Fortunately, Sources, I mean, alternatives like crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, um, new programs that understand better that you don't develop a sector like this by uh, stating that you want 100 good companies and you find 100 examples to develop. No, you say, you know, if I need 100 companies, what I need to do is to invest in 1,000 ventures. That's, that takes quite quite a change in your mentality, especially if you're a government, because uh, for better or worse, because governments uh, tend to need to be accountable, it's very difficult to take risks. You cannot take that much risk with public money. So it's designed to avoid public officials to take risks. But slowly, we are moving into a way in which we can justify some risk taking and mobilizing some resources to solve that problem and help the market uh, of this person um, develop. Now, there are examples of how this is working and how this can work well. This guy is Gila Liberte. He had a dream in 1984. That dream was financed partly by the Canadian Council of Arts and Culture, and by 1993, it stopped receiving any money. But by the time it was consolidated in the Cirque du Soleil. The Cirque du Soleil is pretty much the largest uh, live arts company in the world. More than 5,000 employees and revenues of over $1 billion. That's big in any sector of the economy. So when somebody tells me, no, the problem in creativity and arts and culture is that we cannot be big, I say, well, look at Guy. I mean, I don't say, I'm not saying that everybody has to be like that, but that it is possible to achieve that in this sector. In that sense, it's, it's possible. These are the cholets. Cholets are made in Bolivia. And if you can find the, the word there, cholet, chalet, cholet is a chalet for cholos. So this is something that shows how creativity is starting to change the landscape of our cities and how this identity we have is something that really comes to the rescue to create new jobs, new opportunities, and new ways to interact with each other. The, the work from, from, from uh, Juan Jose Campanella is also amazing. You can see here El Hijo de la Novia, you can see uh, uh, the, the, the movies in Latin America, you can see El Hijo de la Novia, you can see uh, El Secreto de Sus Ojos, and you can see uh, Relatos Salvajes. I mean, this is just the Argentinian um, uh, uh, cinema, which is in, in a way as independent as it can be. But you also have great, uh, amazing uh, stories of good movies happening more and more often with better quality in Latin America, across Latin America, even Paraguay, uh, 
Costa Rica, Colombia, Peru, Chile are now generating a lot more movies. And this is not uh, for free. This is part of a change in how we approach public policy in the region. Uh, and of course, uh, there's another issue that is very important with the creativity and arts and culture. And this guy, Malcolm Gladwell, um, uh, some people like him, some people don't. Uh, that's irrelevant in this case because what matters is that uh, he calculated with some uh, sound uh, research that in order to become excellent at something, you need about 10,000 hours of training. I'm not saying to be able to do something, not to become really excellent. And the thing is, if we want to have really excellent artists, creatives, and, and people in our sector, well, it happens that we need to educate them from the very early ages. Because if you start becoming excellent at the age of 20, it will take you to <laughs> under about 32, 35 to become that good. Plus, you are not no longer in your prime age to learn stuff. You are still able to learn, you are still able to develop creativity, but it's not your best moment. So that's when education becomes very important. And right now, there's a very interesting uh, change in how education is being approached. After following a model designed to educate people for an industrial age, finally, in the last decade or so, there's been a very important shift. Let's stop thinking about how to train people to follow instructions, and let's start training people on how to solve problems. And they made a very important improvement. They came with the STEM. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I say, great, but you're missing something here. You're missing an A for arts and a D for design. Because if you don't have anybody really dreaming about the future, then what is that thing that the engineers, the mathematicians, the scientists are going to look for? But it's not only that. You can make great advancements in, in science. If you don't have designers that can make those, those advancements into things that people can use and improve their lives, then you are not really, really uh, contributing in the way you are expecting. So if we want to make all of this system sustainable, we need to, to keep working on that. Because in the 19th century, in Latin America, we, we totally ignored industrialization. And we are still paying the price for that. In the early 20th century, we really hesitate and, uh, and undertook the, the, the technological revolution, electricity, uh, and we are still working on that, uh, and we are still paying the price for that. Right now, we have the chance, the one and only opportunity to give our youth the tools and the, and the, way and the means to show us, to lead us into the digital revolution. We can do that, and that's the opportunity that we really need. That's what we call the orange economy. Thank you very much. You can download it for free here in Spanish, English, and Greek. Thank you.